Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight in this uh, online chat. Uh, we're so happy to have you and considering Miami Law School. Um, topic of today's chat is corporate and business law for prospective students at Miami Law School. <clears throat> My name is Greg Levy. I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Um, I'm Assistant Dean here for Academic Affairs, Registration, and Student Services. And joining me today uh, is Professor uh, Andrew Dawson who is a professor here at the law school. He teaches in contracts, bankruptcy, and commercial law. And uh, we also have uh, Professor Scott Eichhorn, who's a practitioner in residence and a supervising attorney for our investor rights clinic. Um, so we look forward to them sharing um, their knowledge about these subject areas and answering your questions. Um, before we get started, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that it should be an interactive chat. And feel free to use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to type in questions. Um, we will walk, work our way through the presentation, but stop along the way to respond to uh, any and all of your questions. Um, so we look forward to uh, hearing from you throughout the evening. Um, the first question we thought we would uh, address is, what does it actually mean to practice in, in corporate or practice business law? And, and for this, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Dawson to give us a little overview on this, this area of law. Yeah, the practice of corporate and business law is, is very broad. It can include, it can range from litigation, negotiating contracts, to navigating through sort of the regulatory world. In other words, it, it deals with the way businesses, businesses interact with one another, where they interact with their customers, with their shareholders, with their creditors, with the public at large. It includes a broad range of skill sets and subject matters. Thanks so much, Professor Dawson. So as Professor Dawson mentioned, it's a really uh, broad area of law. And what we put together here is a list of uh, a lot of different areas. And, and you'll find many of these are also classes at the law school that uh, lawyers who practice in corporate law or business law will touch on. So uh, Professor Eichhorn, you maybe want to pick one or two of these areas and explain a little bit about, about those areas and how a business or corporate lawyer would, would, would deal with them in practice? Sure, sure. I think this list provides a great overview of sort of the breadth of what corporate law can include that Professor Dawson just referred to. Uh, what I particularly deal with in the practice area and uh, what I do at the law school and the legal clinic focuses on uh, securities, and specifically securities arbitration, which is a form of, of litigation. So that's one thing that you see on the list over there. And kind of tack on to something that Professor Dawson already mentioned, uh, corporate law as, as a term is, is oftentimes used to describe practice of law in the area of uh, transactional sort of representation of, of corporate clients. Um, sometimes we also use it in other ways that it's even broader than that, which goes to include um, litigation, uh, of claims between corporate clients, against corporate clients. And those are kind of two separate pathways. Um, but what we're, what we're talking about today is kind of focusing on either one of those potential avenues that you can pursue. Um, so, so really, the way we're using it, we're, we're looking at anything uh, from corporate governance and advising a client on deals and mergers and acquisitions um, to litigation um, that you may be faced with in advising a corporation. So. One thing that's important to understand for, for any lawyer who's going to be a litigator, um, which is where my background is, sort of the general regulatory landscape of, of the industry in which you're operating, and in a specific industry um, uh, where uh, the investor rights clinic that I help run is focused, uh, is the securities, uh, which is highly regulated. It's a basic uh, course that, that's offered at many law schools. Uh, law school curriculum taught here by Professor Albert. Um, he does a fantastic job with that. So uh, one of the courses that you know I I would I would recommend that anybody who's going to be uh, advising clients any kind of capitals 
financing type of issues, capital raising, um, the securities regulatory landscape is really important um, for you to understand. And then a lot of these other categories of law um, would come up for you, for general counsel, for a uh, corporation, anything from labor claims, uh, Drew is a, is a professor who focuses on bankruptcy, corporate bankruptcy is certainly uh, something that requires a, a level of specialization uh, that, that you begin um, in your, at the University of, of Miami. Uh, the securities area, other than the securities regulation and investor rights clinic where I work, uh, you, you also have a couple of uh, other classes like securities litigation, who's taught by some adjunct, taught by some adjunct faculty. Um, and in that case, you're going to be looking at the, the kinds of cases, the matters that you might have to defend on behalf of a corporate client if regulatory action were brought against that particular client. And there's also another course called broker-dealer regulation, taught by Teresa Burgess, uh, which focuses specifically on those regulations. Thanks so much, Scott. And Professor Dawson, did you want to touch on any of these other areas on the list? Yeah, one one subject that I always recommend to all my first year students. I teach contracts, which is we deal with you know that's a lot of transactional sort of work and litigation in the one L year. And students who have an interest in business law, I always recommend that they take as two Ls a business entities class. Basically, understanding the relationship of the owners of a business with the business itself, as well as the understanding the nature of that business formation, the nature of that business, and the way it interacts with creditors and the way it interacts with the uh, with the government, particularly the Internal Revenue Service. I think that's a, found, a fundamental course that students would take if they're interested in business law. Um, Clearly, I'm biased. I also teach commercial law. I, I, I recommend that as another sort of fundamental course and just sort of un understanding the relationship between you know debtors and their creditors. And then bankruptcy is where that all ends up. And where it ends up attracting to a lot of students is bankruptcy, as Professor Eichhorn said, is a very specialized world in the sense it's a codified body of law. It is, at the same time, generalist. Everything, that, think of all the problems that businesses have whether it's environmental liabilities, whether it's you know, General Motors with ignition switch problems, whether it's you know, mass tort liability, all ends up in the bankruptcy court where it's one structure to deal with the whole range of problems that could lead to financial distress. And in the, in the bankruptcy law scheme, we also have you know, the overlay of the consumer side, which we'll talk about again uh, in a little bit when we discuss our clinical offerings. Great. Thanks so much, Professor Dawson. So uh, also at Miami, we wanted to um, make you aware, mention um, there are three, uh, or I guess four different joint degree, three joint degree and a triple degree opportunity um, at Miami Law School for students who may be interested in, um, in the business aspect of um, other industries. So first is the, the more traditional JD MBA, which will be your, your MBA degree with your JD. Most students will traditionally complete that in uh, four four years. Um, the JDMM is a JD and a Master's in Music Business and Entertainment Industries, and that's offered through the School of Music um, for, um, for folks who are uh, maybe interested in pursuing uh, the, the business side of the music and entertainment industries. We also have a joint degree of the JD and LLM in Entertainment Arts and Sports Law. This is one of our, uh, actually, it is our newest LLM degree, and um, an LLM is a is a legal master's, so it's a post JD degree, but you could do it as a joint degree um, with your JD uh, separately. They're a three year and a one year degree together. Um, you could do it in seven semesters, so you save a semester um, by doing them together. And the approach, if you're interested in this industry, is very much from that of a corporate. Uh, attorney's perspective. So our director of the program, um, uh, Director Harold Flagelman, who just moved here from uh, Los Angeles as a practicing attorney for 36 years in the corporate department, um, most recently at Loeb & Loeb, he uh, co-chaired their corporate media and entertainment practice group. But most of his work included doing deals, corporate deals, in the entertainment industry. So he's very much designed the program in a way that takes a corporate 
uh, attorney's approach to dealing with uh, these industries. Um, and last but not least is a triple degree. So uh, two of our, if you have an undergraduate BBA uh, business degree, um, you have the opportunity to potentially pursue a triple degree, which is a, um, which you get a JD, MBA, and then one of our LLMs, and it is available in um, estate planning, um, tax, or real estate. Um, and it's a, it, it's a much more complicated in terms of how that sets out and, and the time allocations for that program, so I would refer you to the website if you're interested in um, potentially learning more about that program. <clears throat> Next, um, our career office just um, provided us a, a sample list here of some of the um, internships and externship opportunities that um, students in um, our externship program have had that have involved both the corporate and business um, <clears throat> law. Um, and uh, and this doesn't include um, clerk jobs, that, clerking jobs, that summer jobs that students may have had at, at law firms, which is uh, you know another route that some of our students may may take as well. Next, we're going to use um, something that I think um, for for those of you who obviously are in the process of of selecting a law school, um, you will learn um, if you if you haven't already something unique about um, law schools um, is that they have clinical education, um, and that's um, uh, essentially students getting to take the role. Um, of of lawyers under uh, super direct supervision of our supervising attorneys and clinical faculty, um, and really getting um, hands on work working with clients on cases, um, and uh, we uh, have a bankruptcy clinic and we also have an investor rights clinic which Professor Eichhorn um, supervises. And um, we thought that uh, for the next uh, part of the presentation, um, it would be it would be great to show kind of two cases that our clinics have dealt with. So these were our students who were interested in these areas and pursued the clinical route. Um, they were able to actually work on under the supervision of the relevant attorneys. So um, first, I'm going to turn over to Professor Eichhorn to talk a little bit about um, this case in their investor rights clinic. Yep, thanks, Greg. And uh, I hope everybody can hear me a little bit better now. I apologize if you had trouble earlier, but I think I've corrected the technical problem. As, as Greg mentioned, uh, I, I supervise the Investor Rights Clinic. I'm a co-director of that with Theresa Burgess, and we have a very robust clinical program at the University of Miami. There are many different clinics um, that students can choose from, but the two we're going to focus on today are the Investor Rights Clinic bankruptcy clinic. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Investor Rights Clinic, and then I'll explain to you an example of a recent case uh, that we worked on uh, and obtained a great result for our client. So law school clinics generally uh, are live client clinics. Many of our clinics here uh, represent live clients, and students will uh, handle everything that a lawyer normally would. Uh, and they do so under the supervision of a licensed attorney uh, like myself and the other directors of the other clinics. So it's a really neat opportunity to gain practice experience while you're getting credit for law school uh, and at the same time uh, benefiting from the supervision of an experienced attorney. Uh, so what kind of work do we do at the Investor Rights Clinic? Uh, well, we represent investors. And the investors we represent have to meet certain criteria. Uh, in other words, if somebody is able to afford an attorney, they're not necessarily they're not necessarily the client that a clinic would represent. Because the purpose of the clinic is to provide legal representation where there otherwise would not be. A, a perfect example of an individual uh, who ha had a, a perfectly legitimate claim and suffered damages as a result of broker misconduct uh, was a woman named Kathy Panuski. And uh, Mrs. Panuski uh, was, was an older lady uh, who had been uh, never, who had no investment experience uh, prior to, to meeting the broker um, who eventually made some recommendations that we'll talk about uh, that cost Mrs. Panuski her, her life savings. Not a substantial amount of money. Um, she 
had $80,000 or so savings over her lifetime, uh, and, and she needed to invest that money in a way that she could maybe earn a little bit of income from it, but also to preserve her, her capital. Uh, she couldn't afford to take risks. Well, unfortunately for Mrs. Panucci, she went to a broker who put his interest ahead of hers. And this broker recommended uh, an investment uh, that's called a REIT, R-E-I-T, which stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. And there are many different kinds of REITs that are available for investors to choose from, uh, and all of them are uh, investment in real estate. It can be most oftentimes commercial. So there are some of them that are considered very safe, and there are others that are considered very risky. And for those that are considered risky, the risks are, of course, that you will lose your investment. And for that reason, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, and, and FINRA, which is the Financial Industry Regulatory Board, uh, have promulgated rules about what qualifications investors have to meet in order to purchase one of these risky real estate investment trust investments. Uh, so in this particular case, the broker misrepresented the information regarding Mrs. Panuski's net worth, her, her ability to sustain losses, uh, and her investment experience, her capability to, to judge the risks and the merits of the investment. And he told her just to sign the forms that he had completed fraudulently on her behalf and that he was going to give her this investment that normally only rich people were allowed to invest in. He didn't tell her that there's really good reasons for that. He represented the investment as something that was guaranteed to pay her a high level of income. And sure enough, the investment paid a few dividend payments and ended up uh, going down in value very steeply and Another, benefit, another feature of this that wasn't disclosed to our client is that as this was going down in value, as she wasn't receiving any of those dividend payments, well, she also couldn't sell the investment. Um, so she was stuck, and she didn't know what to do. And she eventually came to us, and she had only about 30 days left until she could file this claim because of a statute of limitations issue. So we put some of our students on it as a, a priority um, to file a claim within the uh, allowed amount of time. We got it done the day before her claim was set to expire. And we looked at the case and looked at the losses, and we saw that she had lost around five or $6,000 of money out of her pocket, out of, out of this investment. Okay? But we didn't look at it as a five or $6,000 case because we said that there should have been another investment that would have been more appropriate for this woman to have bought at the time that she went to her broker. So we actually said that if you look at the opportunity cost of what she could have been invested in the same time period, she would have had about twenty or thirty thousand dollars more than what she ended up with. Well, we were able to convince the arbitrator uh, after the case went through to a decision uh, that we were right. And the arbitrator ended up awarding her even more than what we asked for because he thought the conduct was so bad that he awarded punitive damages. So she recovered about $48,000 in compensatory damages, inclusive of punitive damages. And the arbitrator also awarded the clinic $33,000 in attorney's fees. Uh, so that was a great uh, result for a, a client who couldn't be more deserving Students who worked on that case got fantastic experience and got to see the results of helping somebody uh, like Mrs. Panuski, who otherwise never would have found an attorney uh, to bring this claim on, on her behalf. So that's just one of the examples of uh, one of the more recent cases we worked on. And it was, in fact, uh, such a successful award that the uh, respondent, the defendant, has moved to vacate the award in federal court which is a whole other story, um, and one that's giving our students uh, that experience as, as well. So, um, so Scott, you mentioned that the, 
You mentioned the students were able to take this claim and, and file all the necessary um, um, every all the necessary paperwork with the arbitrator in this in this short window. Can you give um, some of the students some examples of actually the the types of things that the students are getting to do under your and Professor Virgis's supervision in the clinic? Absolutely. So the students at the Investor Rights Clinic and the students who who helped out Mrs. Kanuski um, were responsible for just about everything. Um, subject to supervision of myself and Professor Burgess. So what does that mean in a typical case for us? Uh, our students would have done all of the investigative work uh, to evaluate the claim at the outset. Mrs. Spanuski comes in as a phone call. We don't know anything about her. We don't know anything about her case. And our students are charged with collecting that information in a variety of ways, primarily uh, from our client herself, and after that, we'll get documents that are relevant from usually brokerage firms. And those documents help us uh, really fill in the gaps of the things that our clients might not remember or understand. Uh, so the first step is to sort of find all that information, and that's something our students did in this case, and they do consistently in, in all of our other cases as well, through client interviews, doing brokerage firm documents, and once we have that information, uh, the students work on putting it together in what we call a statement of claim, which is similar to a complaint in court, and it initiates the arbitration proceeding. Uh, it's really more like a uh, short brief than a complaint like you would find in court. So it's a lot of work to prepare one of the uh, mini briefs that initiates the arbitration. And from there, the students did all of the work uh, of the arbitration, which primarily involved additional document discovery, uh, which you know, we, in, in any litigation, the parties exchange documents. So we were, our students were responsible for asking the other side for the documents that we knew we needed from them and for uh, getting the documents from our clients that the other side requested as well. Um, so that's that's a big part of, of any litigation, the discovery stage of the case, uh, and it's something the student it's something the students got hands-on experience with um, in, in this particular case. And then they even wrote a second brief at the end, which was the final submission uh, that the arbitrator based his decision on after we've gone through the entire discovery process. So overall, it was about an eight-month-long uh, window of time from the time when we heard from Mrs. Panuski until the case went to the decision um, by the arbitrator. We were thrilled to work out the way it did. Thanks so much, Professor Eichhorn. Um, just to address a, a, a student question, um, one of the students asked, <clears throat> Um, during which year are uh, law school are students eligible to enroll in clinical programs such as the Investor Rights Clinic, or when are you eligible, or when would you recommend that we take them? And I, I responded in the chat that uh, students are, are, are eligible to enroll um, in their second and third year, and actually as early as their, their summer, between their first and second year, I believe about four or five of our clinics run a summer clinic, um, which, which students uh, would, be, would be eligible as, as what we call rising 2Ls, who have just completed their, their first year. Um, to enroll. Um, some of the clinics have a slightly different requirements. I know in the case of the bankruptcy clinic, um, which we're going to get to in a moment, um, uh, most of the, uh, the students need to be in their third year um, to participate in the clinic. But most of our clinics are available for second and third year students. Um, in terms of uh, the question of academic requirements for participating in the clinics, um, each of the clinics have a, an application process. It's actually a common application among um, all of the clinics, and you could select Select um, you know and kind of rank and preference order which clinics you would like to participate in. Um, in addition to the investor rights and bankruptcy clinic, we also have clinics in um, a medical legal clinic. We have a children and youth law clinic, an immigration clinic. Um, we have a, um, a clinic in um, uh, wrong, wrongful convictions or innocence innocence clinic, um, and we have a new startup. Immigration. We have a new startup law practicum, which is kind of sort of like a clinic on, uh, for startup and entrepreneurship. Um, so we have a really robust um, set of clinic offerings. So in terms of, I mean, Scott, um, Professor Eichhorn, do you want to add anything else to that in terms of the? 
I think it, you, you know, you answered the question um, uh, uh, that, that was asked, and I, can, I could just add that in, in my sort of anecdotal experience, uh, we pretty much have a mix of, of 2Ls and 3Ls uh, at my particular clinic. And in terms of when to take a clinic, you know, that could be different for every student. Um, but we certainly do accept both 2Ls and 3Ls, and uh, it just depends on, on your academic plan, uh, which one, which option might be the, the best one for, for you, and that's something you can discuss with an academic advisor as well. Absolutely. All right, well, moving on, I'm going to now turn over to Professor Dawson, who's going to talk to you about a sample case that our bankruptcy clinic recently handled. Right, so our, our bankruptcy clinic recently had a, re received a referral from one of the bankruptcy judges in town. Judge Crystal had a case come before him about a, a man who was coming to he filed a Chapter 13 bankruptcy case as an effort to save his home. The family home was about to be foreclosed on. He filed a bankruptcy case. The ju judge Crystal immediately realized that this individual needed legal assistance and referred him to the Miami uh, Bankruptcy Assistance Clinic. Our students took a look at the case file, met with the client, looked at his case file, and realized that it's a complicated area of law. He had been representing himself pro se. The students decided that the best result for him would be to actually dismiss his case and start all over. So they rebooted the case, ended up walking him through from start until finish, and managed to help him through the Chapter 13 process to renegotiate the home mortgage with his lender. And this is something, you know, for our students, we're the representing our individuals like this. These are low-income individuals who oftentimes are facing foreclosure. It's the most common sort of client. What our student, and there's a certain amount of mechanics of this, simply doing things the right way. And what they realize, though, through the mechanics, is that bankruptcy law ultimately is just an invitation to a negotiation. We have clients who come in who've been trying to work with their bank or with other creditors. Sometimes they're student loan creditors. Sometimes they're oftentimes their home mortgage lender, who simply will not negotiate with the individual. What our clients, what our students are finding is that when they commence a bankruptcy proceeding, all of a sudden the bank comes to the table. The student loan lender they come to the table and they're reworking deals for these clients. And I, for me, watching these students do this process, first off, they're, they're learning a very technical area of the law. They're developing an important skill set that's going to be valuable, whether they continue in bankruptcy practice or go elsewhere. They're learning how to work with a statutory body and a complex set of rules. But they're also learning how to use the law as a leverage point. They're able to get good, they're, they're problem solving is ultimately what they're doing. They're using the law to solve problems. Clients come in with a wide range of problems and they're able to, through the bankruptcy process, address these set of problems and learn how to learn a lot of negotiation skills along the way. Thank you so much, Professor Dawson. And um, one of the students also asked about the academic requirements for um, for instance, for the Investor Rights Clinic, and also how many uh, students are typically um, involved in a clinic. So, uh, Professor Eichhorn, maybe you want to touch on those couple questions? Sure, sure. So, as a, as a general rule, um, the, the baseline requirement for a clinic, uh, as far as a GPA goes, is 2.0. Um, now, you know, that applies to, to any of our clinics. Um, and each of the clinics uh, may have their, their own uh, requirements or prerequisites uh, in order to apply for that clinic. But to the specific question for Investor Rights Clinic, we, we don't have any uh, pre-required pre uh, courses that you need to take before you take the Investor Rights Clinic. Um, securities regulation or, or something like that uh, might help you. Some of our students have uh, prior experience in, in the securities industry before, before they come to law school, um, and then that can oftentimes be helpful. Uh, but we also have students who don't have any kind of financial experience whatsoever, um, and some of them have done just as well or better than our students who are more familiar with the issue. So for us, we, we assume that our incoming students um, are, are not familiar with investment, are not familiar with security. Uh, regulation or 
for securities arbitration, and you can use the that way. We have typically uh, in, the, in the area of, of 15 to 18 students um, at our clinic, and, and I, between myself and, and Professor Burgess and another adjunct professor, uh, we, we all will supervise uh, a group of, of those students. Uh, currently, I have five students under my supervision. Great. Thanks so much, Professor Eichhorn. Um, so moving on with our presentation here, um, we wanted to talk about some of the uh, opportunities for JD students to get involved in these areas at Miami Law. Um, so I know this was also, this also kind of dovetails with a question earlier. Um, a student had asked if the joint degrees um, are a different application process and if they have access to um, this, these courses in the curriculum. So um, all of the joint degrees do have a separate application process. Um, in most cases, if they're with LLM programs and they're uh, programs inside the law school, um, students apply in their second year of law school if it's a joint degree with an LLM. If it's one of the external um, graduate programs at the University of Miami, such as the business school with the MBA or the music school at the uh, Masters in Music Business and Entertainment Industries, um, what you would typically find is that those students, um, there's, a, there's a variety. Some of them have applied at the same time they apply to law school. Other ones you'll find them applying um, later after their first year of law school. Um, so I don't think there's a, there's a set answer to that. In terms of the access to the curriculum, um, in the LLM programs, some of the programs have courses which are essentially what we would call cross-listed, where they're listed both in the LLM programs and the JD programs. Um, so for instance, in our, um, to get down to the last bullet point on this slide, some of our practical skills courses, the negotiating and drafting for the business of entertainment is a um, course that professor, director of the the entertainment LLM program teaches, that's Professor Flagelman. And uh, he teaches that course as a uh, kind of takes you through a deal. Um, he's, he had done many deals in practice, and, and he uses kind of acquiring a music publishing catalog, for instance, as the asset and, and takes you through the acquisition deal. A um, course like that is a course that's required in the LLM program, but is also open to JD students with certain prerequisites. In the case of that course, it's business associations or business entities. So there are many courses which are available, like I said, are in the LLM program, but are available to JD students. Um, you would just have to look through our catalog or you know, follow up separately if you want to know specifically what some of those are. Now, in terms of the uh, courses that are um, outside of the law school, so at the business school or at the music school, um, with appropriate permission from the other schools, um, our law school allows you to take up to six credits outside the school of law. Um, so at another graduate program, as long as it's a graduate level course, and it, you could count the six credits towards the 88 credits required for your JD degree. Now the grade doesn't count as part of your GPA, but you, the credits will count towards satisfying the 88 credits required of you to graduate. So there's a, you know, kind of more information about that um, once you know you would matriculate as a student here, but there are opportunities for you to take courses outside of the law school and other programs um, if you are not admitted um, or fully participating as a joint degree student in the program, I guess would be the best way to answer that. Um, so we have an extensive curriculum in the second and third year besides some of the things I just mentioned. And um, later, we're going to have a, a specific slide that, that lists some of the specific elective courses in some of these areas. But um, uh, if you go online to our website, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, we have our, our course catalog. It's called Course Link, and it's the place where students can go. I just put it in the chat um, to um, get more information about the courses. You could see all the offerings that we're offering currently this semester, and you could go back to fall 2013 to see the last few semesters. If you click on the course number, um, you'll be able to uh, actually read a little bit more about each of the offerings. Um, the clinical programs, as we mentioned, the bankruptcy clinic, the investor rights clinic, and brand new um, this semester is the first semester it launches the startup practicum. And that is a um, similar to the clinical model. Um, we have a director of the uh, startup uh, practicum who uh, works with students in advising um, startups and entrepreneurs in dealing with uh, legal issues um, 
uh, as they're trying to make their ideas into a reality. So um, it's been a very popular, very um, a lot of a lot of interest in this area um, among among our students right now. Um, there's a there's a, a two credit course also that he that, that the professor uses as a prerequisite in startup law and entrepreneurship, which which students will take and then um, you know possibly move into the practicum after. Um, the externships we mentioned um, we showed the list before. So many of our students participate in externships um, either during the year or during the semester. Um, in these areas, uh, student organizations. Um, there are many student organizations. Um, so we have like a tax law society, um, business law. So you'll see if you go on our website, you can see all the student organizations. They um, organize um, various events. They could range from networking events to social events to um, lunchtime panels, where over lunch they'll have speakers come in from the community um, to talk about, you know either hot topics or something that their membership is interested in. Um, so as a first year student, you could definitely get involved in many of those student organizations and um, thereafter, you know, participate either as a member or in the leadership of the organization. <clears throat> Uh, various faculty members. I know Professor Dawson has research assistants almost every year. Um, we'll have uh, opportunities for students to get involved as uh, as research assistants, um, either in the second semester of your first year, in the summer, or thereafter, um, working along with the faculty member um, in their in their uh, research. And the last thing I want to mention, and this really goes to our, our curriculum, but um, there's a, been a development of these a uh, lot more practical skills courses. I mentioned the negotiating and drafting for the business and entertainment. Um, business planning is another one, and reorganization and bankruptcy, which maybe Professor Dawson for a moment could tell us a, a little bit about kind of that type of a course. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the reorganization and bankruptcy course allows gives the students an opportunity to apply apply what they've learned in the basic bankruptcy course to the corporate reorganization scenario. And what they're actually doing throughout the course is working through a corporate reorganization from the writing motions, actually arguing motions in front of bankruptcy judges. One of the great things about this course in my mind, not only is it taught by some excellent adjunct professors, but also is the bankruptcy judges in the Southern District of Miami have been very supportive. And so, you know, Judge Mark recently was on campus and the students had to argue a case in front of him and get to actually practice as they would in court. For many of the students in this area, right, this is some of the most valuable practical experience they will get in learning just not only the practice of legal writing, uh, but also hearing right from the best sources, both top practitioners and the bankruptcy judges themselves on best practices within this industry. And it's been extraordinarily successful for the students who have taken this. They end up with the, not only getting great knowledge, but also getting a really great professional network. They get to tap into one of the greatest resources here at University of Miami mm -hmm. Law School, which is our vast alumni and very supportive alumni, alumni network. Um, for the bankruptcy students who also do the clinic, right, this is also a great spot where the, you know, highlights more the writing side where the clinic, they get to actually appear in live court. So this is the next best thing that you could do for representing a corporate client in live court. Great. Thanks so much. So here we've put together on this list um, uh, just kind of a sampling of the electives that we offer that touch in on these areas of business and corporate law. And I'm going to turn it over um, first to Professor Eichhorn, um, who can tell us, a, you know, pick, pick maybe a couple of the courses um, and, and, and talk you know, through them, uh, kind of what makes them unique and, and how it may um, kind of amplify a student's business or corporate law curriculum. Sure, sure. It's, it's, it's quite a list and now that I see all of those electives uh, together in, in one place. Uh, so, you know, giving from an overview perspective um, of, of, of the electives, these are, these are going to be classes that uh, you can become involved with, of course, in your second or, or third year, uh, first year for curriculum. And uh, a, a, a lot of students uh, who come in to law school uh, with with a preference and, and with a plan to 
practice in the area of, of corporate law or commercial litigation uh, will will start with some of these basic level courses. I think business associations is one that's been mentioned a couple times. That's a very foundational uh, course uh, that I would recommend on any attorney who wants to be involved in any aspect of corporate law um, should should take. So the other courses are much more uh, targeted, and um, they are courses you'd want to consider, for example, um, if, if you wanted to get into tax law, right? Um, those, those, those federal income tax uh, courses, international tax, if that's interested in the other um, general law, um, you know, you would, you would direct yourself towards those courses if you had specific sort of um, it, we've seen from a lot of our students who eventually come to the Investor Rights Clinic uh, is that they've taken some of the, the foundational courses like business associations. Uh, oftentimes we also see students that have taken securities uh, regulation. Um, that's a very sort of core class um, in that area of, of law. And then a lot of times uh, students will have come through our clinic as a, as a 2L We'll also take these courses after they've already been in the clinic because the clinic has, has sparked an interest in securities law um, for them that they, they might not have had before. Uh, so these are all courses you can take before uh, a clinic, uh, in most cases at the same time as you're doing a clinic or after a clinic uh, if you still have your third year. And Professor Dawson, you want to talk about some of these courses as well? Yeah, it is a it is a long list, but as you think about it, all of a sudden corporate law can en encompass much more. So the, here's one that's sort of a, a gateway sort of course is you know our compliance and risk management course. Oftentimes we may not think of this as core corporate law practice, but it's increasingly become so, right? As industry has been more, there's a more a wider and wider array array of federal and state regulations governing what businesses do. A lot of areas that we previously thought of as maybe being extra legal have been brought into the law. For instance, you know, human resources practice has increasingly become very much more about a legal regulation. Even within universities, the compliance of you know universities with federal regulations, compliance departments have become much broader. We see compliance as a huge aspect of what university athletics is about. These days, compliance with NCA regulations. This is a real growing area of law for a lot of a lot of uh, in-house counsel dealing with complying with numerous federal regulatory agencies. So when you start thinking it that way, even this list gets even longer as we we start thinking about issues such as environmental law, energy law, thinking of other fundamental sort of courses is dealing with administrative law and understanding the administrative state that is producing all this regulation. It really is a vast area um, and, a gr and a growing area. And compliance is one area where we're probably going to see a lot of job growth over the next several years. Great. Thanks so much. If I could just tack on to yep. uh, something that, that Professor Dawson is absolutely right about, um, is that the, the, the growth of compliance and its, it's, important, its importance to, to, to businesses um, it, you know, is, is increasingly um, it, Growing and that's, that that includes the uh, broker dealer uh, space as as well. Um, myself and the other professor at the Investor Rights Clinic have had conversations with in-house counsel um, in, in people in compliance departments for broker dealers who are are based here in, in Miami, and they have a real need for people who are are trained in compliance uh, and have legal training who might not necessarily function in a role as an attorney. Uh, but the experience they have and the legal training they have um, gives them the skills they need uh, to work in an in-house uh, compliance department. Uh, and it's a very international uh, landscape in Miami in terms of the broker dealers who are here. Uh, so they, they're oftentimes interested in uh, people who are going to be able to work within the compliance schemes of the United States as well as other countries. Great. Thanks so much, Professor Icon. 
So uh, this is just a sample list of uh, faculty who um, who teach uh, courses in these area, supervised clinics. Um, obviously, you've met Professor Dawson and Professor Icorn here on the chat. Um, but we definitely encourage you to um, go through our website and learn a little bit more about each of these faculty members um, who teach um, many of the courses that we just um, looked at on the previous list. And last and but not least, um, this was a sample list of uh, placements in the corporate and business law fields. Um, and um, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Eichhorn and then Professor Dawson just to kind of talk us through um, kind of some of these areas and the different kind of uh, career tracks that, that students may take. So what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll build off what I just mentioned uh, in terms of the compliance area where education and business law might, might lead you. That would be in-house uh, type of position working for a firm. Um, now, there are all kinds of other different types of positions. That will either be legal positions where you know you are acting as an attorney, or will be the positions that are more like the compliance positions uh, where you're going to be using your skills but not necessarily in the role of an attorney, in the role of, of, of risk management, compliance, but a very complex regulatory schemes. Uh, we've had students from um, our clinic pursue lots of different paths. Your, your only option you know, isn't going to be uh, to, to go work at a big law firm doing securities work when you graduate, although some of our students have uh, certainly done that. We've also had students who have taken non-legal positions uh, in, in regulatory uh, bodies, regulatory agencies such as, as, as FINRA, uh, where you know they're looking for exactly the type of skills uh, that you you might you, you can attain through through the clinic and through some of the other course offerings here. And it doesn't mean that what you start doing you will do for the rest of your life. But sometimes there are opportunities you might not consider. Uh, because they're non-legal positions, um, but they may eventually lead to promotions, um, additional responsibilities, uh, and will, will give you experience that you wouldn't have gotten anywhere else uh, that you can use to build your career as a lawyer. So I always like to encourage students uh, to, to look at all of the options and not, not just look mm -hmm. uh, at the law firm, although um, that, that certainly is a place where a lot of students in business law end up. Okay. Professor Dawson? For many of my students, what they end up moving on to, if it, some, you know, they may end up moving into a private bankruptcy practice where they're either representing lenders or representing debtors. <clears throat> that sort of work is both a mix of litigation as well as transactional work. Others have gone on to the to the government side and worked in the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice has a uh, a program of United States trustees that monitor the bankruptcy system, and had students enter that realm, which is a growing area and an area of increasing need for for government oversight. Um, on the commercial lending side, we've seen students go both working for clients and actually, you know negotiating deals as well as working some students even going into the banking side themselves. Um, like I said, as, as the regulatory world has sort of increased, more and more jobs are sort of being thought of as, as legal jobs requiring the legal knowledge of how the system actually works. Great. Thanks so much, Professor Dawson. And we had two questions coming via email in advance of the chat that we wanted to uh, try to address now. Um, so the first question, and I'll, I'll leave it to either Professor Dawson or Professor Eichhorn, um, but the question was, do I need to study business or economics in order to be an effective corporate lawyer? No. <laughs> no, I, I don't think... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's necessary at all. Professor Eichhorn mentioned, you know, some of his students have a background, and I've had students as well come in who have some have more of a of a econ background or finance background, um, but absolutely not necessary. Um, many people bring a, a variety of backgrounds into the 
into the classroom, and many of them, a lot of what we're doing is actually, most students, even if they have a background in finance or in economics, don't actually have the background or any background at all in, in the actual bankruptcy code, the tax code, Securities regulation, they're learning, everyone's starting that from scratch. And so I don't think there's too much of a competitive disadvantage coming in with a, a liberal arts background. And I think as Professor Eichhorn mentioned earlier too, we see students that, you know, come either into the clinic or take a course in an area of law that they never kind of thought of as they're, they're having interest in suddenly kind of awakens their interest and then ends up, they end up spending, you know, uh, you know, taking a series of additional courses in their uh, third year or end of their second year um, in that subject area and really become and kind of invest in and, and I think that's part of the, the, the law school process and the learning process. Um, I think the, the last question and maybe uh, Professor Eichhorn if, if you want to answer it, um, it was a uh, question was what is the life like for the average corporate lawyer? That uh, is a very interesting question. I don't know what the average corporate lawyer is, uh, but you know, depending on uh, the you know, where you end up and which which of those roles that you're playing, um, a corporate a corporate lawyer can lawyer can can be very 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 busy. Uh, you might not be in charge of um, your own schedule all the time uh, because things are going to come up at all times. Um, not according to anyone's schedule. Uh, if, for example, you're a general counsel for uh, a company or that counsel by that company on uh, a regular basis. I think it can be a very satisfying uh, area of, of law. Uh, a lot of times uh, I find the, the cases and the subject matter to be intellectually challenging uh, and it, it, it's Something where you can make a very good living, um, depending on how how progresses. Uh, but like anything, it's 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 hard work. I think. Great, and Professor Dawson, anything else you want to add? I think there's a there's a a huge variety of like mm -hmm. what actual practice is maybe like as a corporate lawyer. It can uh, simply because it covers so much. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's hard to say, but I think overall, Professor Icon's probably captured it pretty well. It is a, it's a challenging area of law. It's an intellectually challenging area of law. It takes a lot of time and expertise. Um, but I think it can be very satisfying, and simply in, in large part because it is such a problem-solving area. I think it really it's almost in many ways, it appeals to much of the same sort of skill set that might be uh, sort of an engineer, as a legal engineer solving problems within a complex system. Great. Well, thanks so much. We want to uh, thank everyone who uh, participated in the chat or will be viewing this at a later time. Um, we really hope that this is um, kind of the start of uh, the conversation, and we encourage you to follow up with um, any of us or with um, our uh, recruiting office. Um, I know that uh, many of you had a contact or have been down here on, on tours or for other um, uh, admitted student or prospective student events. Um, so we encourage you to um, continue to stay in touch and continue to ask the questions. Um, we really look forward to seeing you on campus soon and, and hopefully as a, as a student. So uh, go Canes, and uh, we look forward to um, continuing this conversation.